Welcome to episode 15 of Traveling Science. G'day legends, welcome back to Travelling Science, the podcast that's sharing science with the world. My name's Jesse Crow, and I'm the Travelling Scientist, coming to you today from my home in Aries Inlet in Australia. I'm a health science communicator, and on this podcast, we interview doctors, researchers, and experts, hearing their stories and sharing their ideas that can help us to live smarter, happier, and healthier lives. And this week's guest is Jonathan Lossus, a professor of biology at Washington University in St. Louis and director of the Living Earth Collaborative. Jonathan is a biologist who has spent his career studying how species adapt to their environment, focusing primarily on lizards, but more recently, he's been investigating cats. And during our discussion today, he answers questions such as how to make a cat more friendly, what's the deal with cat's whiskers, Should cats be inside or outside? Why do cats love boxes? How to tell if your cat is too fat? Do cats eat humans? Do we own cats or do cats own us? And what to do if you're allergic to cats? And we also discuss things like the health benefits of living with cats, Jonathan's Cat Science University course, cat shows, hairless cats, types of cats that you or I have never even heard of, and the toxoplasmosis mind-controlling parasite that cats often give us. So there's so much to cover in today's show, but before the interview, I'd just like to quickly share a review of the podcast with you. And this week's review comes from Shez Tech, who says, what a brilliant podcast. I love hearing the variety of incredible guests that Jesse has on the show. They all have a wealth of wisdom and experience, which Jesse is able to distill down into simple tips and ideas that we can all learn from. Five stars. Well, Shaztech, you're my new favorite listener. Thank you so much for that review. And if you're listening and you want to be my new favorite listener, take a moment right now to leave a review on Apple Podcasts or Spotify, and I will owe you a Coke. But now, the moment you've all been waiting for, if you've got cats, if you're fond of cats, or even if you're just listening for the hell of it, get excited to hear some facts about felines from the one and only Professor Jonathan Lossus. Professor Jonathan Lossus, welcome to Traveling Science. Well, thank you so much, Jesse. It's a delight to be here. Fantastic. Thank you so much for taking the time. Honestly, we set this interview up quite recently, in the last 24 hours. And I don't think I've ever had so much excitement for a specific guest. I think once I told everyone what we were talking about today, uh, I had a lot of interest. I've got a lot of listener questions. So I'm super excited to get right into it. So just to get started, why don't you tell us where did your fascination with cats start? Sure. Well, uh, so I'm a scientist, as you said, and I've spent my career studying lizards, how they evolve, how they adapt to their environment and so on. But I've always loved cats. Ever since when I was five and my mother and I went to the local animal shelter and adopted a cat to give to my father for his birthday, I've just been crazy about cats. But it never occurred to me to do anything scientifically with them for two reasons. One is I wanted to to go out into nature and study animals doing what they do. And anyone who has tried to follow a cat around knows just how impossible that is. That the moment they figure out what you're doing, which is very quickly, they give you the shake. They go into the bushes or disappear and they're gone. And so cats just didn't seem to be a good subject for the sort of research I wanted wanted to do. Now, in addition, I was under the impression that there really wasn't much interesting science about cats being done. And by cats, I mean domestic cats, not lions and tigers and so on. Just didn't seem an area of fruitful academic scientific inquiry. And so it never occurred to me to study cats, even though I've loved them my entire life. So you got into studying lizards instead, and you've had an illustrious career, and you've written or co-written various research papers, you've written several books, and then more recently, you just changed your mind? You just decided that perhaps cats could be of interest? Pretty much. Uh, so let me, let me tell you how that happened. Um, about 10 years ago, I came to realize I was wrong about the state of cat science. 
that actually scientists were studying domestic cats in the same way that I study lizards and other people study lions and hippos and elephants and so on, using all the latest techniques, DNA sequencing, uh, GPS tracking, isotope analysis. And there actually was a, a rich amount of research telling us all about the cat, where they came from, why they do what they do, even what the future may hold. Uh, and so I had what I humbly think was a great idea. I would teach a class to first year university students called the science of cats. And the idea is that I would lure the students into the class by cats. You know, they love cats. They would take the class. And then we would learn how scientists study nature just using cats as the vehicle. So I had this class, a bunch of students signed up. It worked great. They loved it. I loved it. And we covered all kinds of fascinating material. Well, this was happening just as I was finishing up my first book for the general public, Improbable Destinies. And so it wasn't much of a leap to say, well, this class worked great. There's millions of people out in the world who are interested in cats. Why don't I write a book on the same, with the same goals? And so that's what I did. Fantastic. I, I love the concept of a science of cats course. I mean, if that was at my university, that's definitely something I would have studied. How did you even introduce that? Like, surely you suggested that to uh, some higher ups and they would have said, really? Cat science? <laughs> yes, you know, but not so much. Um, I think that they, they understood that we're always looking for ways to get students interested in science. That, and, and, you know, when they first get to university is a critical time because many students kind of think they're interested in science, maybe as a way to go to medical school or other things. Um, but it's really easy to get disillusioned, especially if you're a biology major, because you have to take these hard introductory courses, intro to biology, intro to chemistry, intro to physics. A lot of students just end up doing other things. So if you can really spark that interest right at the outset, it can set them on that course. So you just made this course intro to cats and everyone was interested. <laughs> Exactly, exactly. I mean, you know, there's just so much fascinating material about cats. And if you start with liking cats and then you learn what we've what we've been able to study about them and realize it really is pretty fascinating. Absolutely. And you can learn so much about cats just from reading your book. Jonathan's book is titled The Cat's Meow and also The Age of Cats, depending on where you are in the world. But it's the same book, and it talks about how giant feline predators from the savannah desert evolved into the little fluff balls in our houses that spend all day sleeping in the sun, but then choose to wake you up at 4am because, I don't know, they're bored or hungry, probably both. And I just wanted to share a quote from the book, something to think about if you have a cat. You've got a mini lion in your house. Cats are not that much changed from their wild ancestors. And I asked Jonathan to expand on this idea. Well, there are today... 42 or 43 species of wild felines. Everyone knows, you know, the big cats. Those are the stars, the ones that have their own week on National Geographic Channel and so on, lions, tigers, leopards. But there are actually 33 or so smaller species. And most people aren't aware of this diversity. They may have heard of maybe the ocelot or the bobcat, but not many others. And there's all kinds of obscure species, the uh, Andean mountain cat, the cod cod, the oncilla, the marbled cat. I could go on and on. No one's ever heard of these cats. Uh, so there's this actually quite a bit of variety of different species. And they do vary. They, there is some variation. There's, of course, big ones and little ones, and they're adapted to live, living in different places. But having said that, to a large extent, a cat is a cat that... If you saw any of these obscure species I mentioned to you, you would know it's a cat. And it would, it would, it's, it's catness would be obvious that the, the cats really aren't very different other than in their, their body size. And I've, I've spoke to, uh, to zoo experts, to people who know cats, and they basically say, if you can watch your cat and read its body language, you can understand what a lion or a tiger is thinking, that they really, there's a, an essence of catness, catness that permeates the entire feel of day. They're just not that different from one, one to another. Incredible. And so these small wildcats that you're talking about, are they very dissimilar to, say, 
feral cats? Is there like uh, some key differences there or? Well, it, it varies. Uh, the species that the domestic cat descended from, the African wild cat, which is found throughout much of Africa and Western Asia, if you saw one walking through your backyard, your, th your thought would not be, what is that African wildcat doing in Vancouver? It would be, what a cool looking cat. I've never seen one quite like it. So and some, some of these wildcat species really do look like just regular old moggies. But, you know, an ocelot, beautiful cat with spots. Uh, the fishing cat has webbed feet, which helps it, uh, you know, when it gets in water and it's got a slightly different shape head. Uh, the marbled cat has a really long tail. So there is some variation in some of the wild species that does make them that you wouldn't think they're a domestic cat. But yet they're, you know, they're still clearly cats. I'm super excited to look up some of these cats and do some research. Yeah. Oh, check out the serval. The serval in Africa may be my favorite. It's this long legged cat with big party size ears and uh, just a spectacularly fascinating animal. So you should definitely look these up, but if you don't have time, don't worry, I've got you. Just use your imagination. And also, if you're watching the video, you can see pictures that I'll post here as well. So the serval, spelled S-E-R-V-A-L, looks like a small cheetah with huge pointy ears. The cod cod, spelled K-O-D-K-O-D, -K -O -D, also looks like a cheetah if it was the size of a house cat and lived in the jungle. The Andean mountain cat looks like a moggy, kind of like a feral cat that you might see in an alleyway, except instead of alleyways, they live in the mountains. The Oncilla is also known as the tiger cat and looks just like a little tiger. The marbled cat has a huge tail and some huge marble-like spots on its back with smaller spots on the front. The African wild cat looks like a normal cat, but with huge ears and strangely long legs, which would help it thrive out in the plains of Africa. And finally, the fishing cat has tiny little ears and webbed feet, so it's adapted for swimming in water and catching its own fish. All of these cats, which I'd never heard of, seem incredible. And now I'm just thinking about how cool it would be to have a little cod cod or an oncilla as a pet. But what about the effects that these cats and feral cats in general can have on our ecosystems? I'd like to talk for a moment about the impacts that cats can have on humans, maybe or maybe the impact that cats can have on the environment. I know that, say, house cats can sometimes get outside and catch wild birds, which can be an issue with biodiversity. And I suppose there's a lot of feral cats out there. Would you say that they have a negative impact on the environment, or, or am I mistaken, or is it... Is it very complicated? It, it is very complicated, and it's actually a very controversial subject in some places. First, let's start with two obvious points. Number one, cats of all sorts are supremely adapted predators. They are excellent at catching prey because that's what they do to eat. Um, secondly, the domestic cat is not very different from its ancestor, the African wild cat which means that it is very easy for a domestic cat, if it finds itself outside, you know, if it's someone dumps it somewhere, or if it's born to a, you know, a feral cat, to, uh, to, be, to live outside. They still have all the instincts, all the equipment, and so on. And so domestic cats revert easily to a wild existence. Now, in some parts of the world, cats have been introduced in places that no wild species of feline has ever occurred. And in those places, the native species have no experience with a predator like a cat. And so they are defenseless. Uh, this is particularly true on isolated islands where often there's, there are no predators of any sort. Would I be correct in saying that Australia is one of those places? Well, I was going to get to Australia in a moment, but I'm talking about uh, it's very similar in Australia. But in many just isolated islands, many of which are in the Pacific near uh, Australia, uh, seabird colonies have just been wiped out because they, they just have no defense. And many other rodent, native rodent species and lizards, they're just not used to a predator like this. And these predators are uh, just so well adapted to killing things. And there are no larger predators to keep the cat population in check, which is what happens in parts of the world. And so the cat population explodes and can just demolish the native species, some of which are often found only on that one island. 
And the same thing has happened to a large extent in Australia, where uh, a combination of two things. One is that, that there are no predators like cats native to Australia. The, the, the quoll is somewhat similar, but not really. And the larger predators in Australia have all been killed off. The thylacine, and there were even some bigger than the thylacine. The Tasmanian devil used to be found on mainland Australia and, and no longer is. And so, again, these, these very talented predators are in a place where there are lots of naive prey and, and few uh, predators that can keep them in check. Now, in some places, dingoes actually do, do keep cats in check in Australia, but in other places, the cats have just... They're just huge populations. And there are lots of species in Australia that have gone extinct with the cat being a major reason why. Foxes are also a problem, but cats are, are a big problem, and there are many more species in danger today. So in some parts of the world, cat, uh, outdoor cats, particularly unowned feral ones, are a huge problem to biodiversity. Mm, absolutely. Keeping that in mind, I have a question for you about... Domestic cats, so uh, owned cats. Do you think that people should be allowed to let their cats go outside or should they be kept inside? Or Because I know in some places it's, it's becoming a rule that cats have to stay inside, I wonder. And to me, that seems unnatural, but I understand the reasoning. So I wonder if you have any thoughts. I, I do have thoughts, and that's another question that is complicated and controversial. And... The reasons to keep cats inside, there are probably three main reasons. First is the impact they can have on native wildlife, uh, which we just talked about. And even in places where they're not, um, you know, wiping out species, they can still kill a lot of prey. And people who like the birds around their house or like chipmunks, uh, they don't like the cats coming and killing them all. They like them in their backyards. And, and then, of course, they are endangering species in at least some places. Uh, that's number one. Number two is that it's bad for the cats. There are lots of risks outside, the most obvious being getting run over by cars. Um, they can also get diseases. They can get lost. They can, they can just bad stuff can happen. And in many places, there are predators uh, that will eat them. In the United States, a big problem is coyotes now. So it's, there's a lot of threats, dangers to cats when they go outside. And then the third reason is that cats may play, may spread some diseases. This is a topic that's gotten a lot of attention recently. I would say it's still a bit unsettled. Uh, one disease in particular, toxoplasmosis, is a disease that is spread by cats, that cats are an important host for the parasite that causes it. So those are all the reasons why it's good to keep cats indoors. Now, the argument that some people make um, is primarily that cats are born to be outside. Mm, cats were never indoors <laughs> originally. Exactly. It's just the way they should be. And it, it's certainly true that there are some cats that just seem unhappy inside Certainly a cat that grows up outside, if you try to bring it inside and make it an indoor cat, it's going to be an unhappy cat many times. Sometimes it works. But even cats that spend their entire life as kittens indoors, sometimes they still have this huge desire to get out and to be outside. And um, that, you know, there, people argue whether that's bad for the cats psychologically or even physically. There, there's, it's, it's hard to know. One thing that is clear is if you keep cats inside, you need to give them a rich, stimulating environment. These are very intelligent animals. They are very curious, and they're exploring the world. They need stuff to do, new places to explore. They like to go into boxes, get, get high off things, different toys, good smells. You've got to give them a stimulating life if they're indoors. And that's really good advice for anyone who has a cat uh, and might have to keep them inside. Make it fun. Make it uh, enjoyable, interesting, exciting for the cats because, like you said, they're very intelligent creatures. Absolutely. Are you doing any research on cats now or is it mostly just uh, the writing and the teaching in your own little curious sort of research? Well, uh, thanks for asking. You know, I got into this uh, first for teaching students as a vehicle to teach students and then to take those ideas and, and you know, and write, write a book to, to tell the public about cats. But something unexpected happened. 
I've actually become captivated by cat science. There are all kinds of interesting questions. And as I was reading the research to write the book, I would have ideas pop into my head. You know, I've studied a question like this with lizards. Maybe we could ask the same question with cats. Or, or here's an interesting phenomenon. How do we understand how it happened? You're like, surely this research has been done, and it just it hasn't yet. Well, exactly. It's, uh, I was surprised how much cat research there is, uh, but there's still a lot we don't know. In fact, it, you know, it amazes me. People often ask me, why do cats do this? Or how did this happen? It's a uh, sometimes obvious question, and we don't know. Um, so there's, and this is true of a lot of science, certainly about the natural world. Even though we know a lot about it, there's all kinds of things we don't know. My research with lizards, a major focus has been looking at how species adapt to their environment and how quickly they can do that. One thing that science has realized in the last few decades is that evolution can occur very rapidly when the environment changes. Now, this is, this is a surprise because we used to think that evolution occurred really slowly, that only over, you know, a glacial, at a glacial pace where you couldn't see it happen unless you had thousands of years. But we now know this is wrong, that when the environment changes and thus natural selection pressures are strong, species can, can adapt very quickly. I think there's a great opportunity uh, to study this in cats, because cats have been introduced all over the world. And so cats now occur in many environments where they previously didn't occur, and undoubtedly they are facing new pressures. Think about just Australia. Some are, there's quite, quite a lot of cats out in the outback where it is blazing hot and where there's very little water. Surely there are strong selection pressures to adapt to desert living. Yet there are also ones in the mountains of Tasmania where it's very cold, it snows, and they undoubtedly need to, to evolve to deal with that. Uh, there's some evidence, well, some live in forests, some live in deserts, th some have adapted to, to eating various types of food. I think it's very likely that wild populations of domestic cats are diverging from each other as they adapt to the environments that they now find themselves in. However, uh, it's, it's almost been unstudied. And so that's a topic that I'm working with a number of people in Australia to begin to, to get at that. Do you foresee any big challenges in researching this? So it, it's still early days, but I think there are two issues that might be challenging. One is that cats can be tough to study, as we, as we said earlier. And you know, one of the reasons I've picked lizards to study is they're easy to study, at least some species. There's lots of them. You can go out and find them easily. Some of them will let you just sit there and watch them. Uh, and they're active during the day, uh, so much easier to observe. None of those things is true of cats. So if you want to study their behavior and ecology, it's much more difficult. You have to use all kinds of tools, uh, GPS tracking, cam kitty cameras, and so on. The other is there are a lot of people who care about cats and have very different opinions about them. And so, and frankly, uh, there are people who care a lot about the welfare of cats living on their own outdoors. And uh, they can be pretty pretty suspicious of what scientists are doing. Why would you want to study those cats? Is it so you can get rid of them? And which, of course, wouldn't necessarily be the reason at all. But so people care strongly about cats, and that can make just getting permission to do standard, non-harmful research difficult. Hmm. You would think that people cared about cats. They would be all for the research to learn as much as we can about them. But I can, I can see how people might be concerned which can be an issue. Yeah, it's very unfortunate that the animal welfare types and the scientists often are at loggerheads with each other. I mean, these are two groups that care about nature, that care about animals. They should be working together, but these days they're often fighting with each other. Bizarre. So many people want to fight with scientists. We just want to, we just want to uh, improve the world as best we can. So true. Do you know of any health benefits of owning cats? Are there any... Is there any research behind the benefits of having a, a little pet cat or two or three or four? <laughs> well, probably the, the biggest health benefit is just uh, that having a companion animal, really of, of any sort, is good for people's mental health. Um, it often helps particularly people who live alone or who are lonely, but just in general, having a cat around some, some 
something to care about and to interact with. And, uh, you know, cats are very affectionate as well, and at least some of them are. And so all those things have very positive effects on, on mental health. I think that's probably the biggest health benefit. Uh, in some places, they catch mice, which is, can be a problem. And uh, those, would be, those would be the two main ones, I think. I, I know there's been some studies that have talked about lower heart rates, reduced stress levels, but then it, that all sort of ties in with improved mental health and just overall well-being. So a 2016 study called Does Cat Attachment Have an Effect on Human Health showed that spending time with cats effectively lowered heart rate and blood pressure, which would reduce the risk of cardiovascular disease. And the longer the subjects had lived with their cats, the more pronounced this effect was. So if you like cats and you have a cat, it could save your life. Unless your cat is kind of a bitch. Yeah, I know we grew up with some cats and they weren't so friendly to me when I was little. <laughs> Maybe that was a negative health impact, but it, it is uh, true. Cats can be quite variable in their interactions with people. A lot of it depends on how the cats are raised, and it turns out cats have a important window in their development from about four to eight weeks of age that really uh, has a large effect on how they will interact with people for the rest of their lives. That if you treat a kitten very kindly during that phase, you handle the cat a lot, uh, pet it, and it gets used to being around people they will often be very affectionate, friendly cats. But if you take a cat that, that's already 10 or 12 weeks old or older, it's going to be much harder to get the cat to be a, a friendly, affectionate one. That's super interesting. I've always wondered how you can make a cat more friendly, and I guess it's those early weeks of development that are crucial, which that makes a lot of sense. <laughs> yes, you know, they do a lot of this in animal shelters where they rescue uh, stray kittens or have a stray cat that gives birth. And not only is it being handled, but it's really ideal to have them handled by multiple people. That if only one person handles them, the cat may uh, become attached to that person, but only that person. Or even it's a problem if it's only, say, women, because they may not react well to men or children. Uh, so there's actually quite, quite a lot of known about the best ways to do this. So in the next little bit, the professor and I talk about our own cats. And I was going to cut this bit out because I value your time and I want to focus on the valuable information of this interview. But if you're listening to this, then you probably love cats and you probably want to hear these stories. Therefore, I didn't cut them out. But if you're just here for the science, feel free to skip the next three minutes. However, if you're here for all of the kitty content that you can handle, then listen on, my friend. Can you tell us a little bit about your cats? Sure. Um, we have four cats now, which is a handful. Um, uh, two, two of them are uh, now 15, Winston and Jane. And their story is that they were, their mother was a stray cat. And sadly, she was run over by a car shortly after they were born. And some people knew that she had just had kittens, so they went out and found them. They were only about two weeks old, and so they were hand-raised. And uh, we then adopted them into our house at, um, at about four months of age, which is a good time to do that. Uh, one of the most interesting things about those two cats is that they are very different in their appearance and their behavior that Winston is a really big boy. He's, he, at his, at his height, it was 17 pounds. And he's a big black and white cat, a gray and white. He, you know, he kind of looks like a cow, you know, white with, with spots. Uh, he's a really big boy. He's not fat. He's just big. Jane, Jane is female, um, but she's slate gray, completely different in color. And she's a standard size cat for a female. Uh, males are bigger than females. So they're really very different. And I've always wondered, how could you have two? And all their personalities are different, too. Uh, Jane is much more outgoing. So I always wondered, how could two such different cats you know, be litter mates? Well, it turns out I now have a pretty good idea. It, it turns out that scientists have discovered that when you have unknown cats, you know, living outdoor in, its, in groups, females, when they are uh, receptive to mating, will mate with many different males. And so it's very common for a female to give birth in which the kittens had different fathers, even in the same litter. And I think it's almost, I'm convinced that's what happened with Winston and Jane and why they're so different. So those are two, those are two of my cats. Um, the other two are younger 
and they are uh, pedigreed cats. They're the breed that we call in the United States European Burmese. In much of the rest of the world, they're just called Burmese. Uh, and we became acquainted with these cats when my father, the, the man who engendered my interest in cats, who we got the first cat way back when, he was getting old. And my mother said, your father needs uh, a cat again. They're, they'd had cats and they hadn't had them for 20 years. And your, your father needs a cat. So uh, there happened to be a cat show in St. Louis where I live. And I should say, cat shows are really quite fascinating. Anyone interested in cats, if you have a chance, go visit one. You can see the great diversity of different breeds of cats that exist today. Anyway, my wife did some homework and to find out what breed of cats would be particularly good for an elderly gentleman who, you know, you want a cat that's very friendly and affectionate, not too rambunctious and so on, but intelligent. And she came up with the European Burmese. And so she said, if you go to the cat show, see if there are any European Burmese there. Well, there were. And I would ask the people who, the breeders, you know, would this cat be a good one for a, an elderly gentleman? The answer, of course, was always yes. Uh, but look, I think any breeder would say that about their breed. But uh, in any case, they said yes. But then one of them said, you know, the European Burmese Rescue Network has a foster cat they're looking to rehome. And maybe your parents could adopt them. Now, to me, this is astonishing, number one, someone who would buy a pedigreed cat, you know, they're kind of expensive, and then mistreat it. But that's what had happened, and somehow the, the network had managed to get the cat relinquished to them. So my parents applied to get the cat. I had to write a letter of recommendation for my parents, um, and they got the cat. And it turns out that the cat, Otten is his name, is the world's greatest cat, or the whole family immediately fell for Otten. And long story short, um, we then got to European Burmese of our own, which are now the world's greatest cats. Otten has fallen to third place. But uh, anyway, it's a delightful breed, and so we have these, these two cats. Fantastic. They all sound incredible. Uh, I should probably give a shout-out to my mom's ragdoll, oh, Ari. A ragdoll. She is beautiful, all white, with uh, gray paws, a gray tail, a little pink nose, Oh, and I think a gray diamond around the, the eyes. They have become the most popular breed in the world. It used to be Persians, but I think ragdolls have replaced them. They are, I've never lived with one, but they're said to be just fantastic companions. And they get their name. I, I'm curious if you've ever seen this. They get their name because supposedly you can pick up a cat, well, a ragdoll, and it will go limp in your arms, hence the name ragdoll. Is that true? Have you experienced that? I've, oh, yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Every, every time they're... Um... It's quite cute. They're, it's almost like a teddy bear or something. <laughs> They're very uh, malleable in the arms. Wow. And my cousin Ella has a few, and she handles them from a very young age, and she can just pick them up and move them around and hold them upside down, and they are just so relaxed and so floppy. It's, it's, uh, they're very cute. Anyway, Jonathan, I've got some listener questions here from you. So many people wrote in with uh, various questions about cats, if you've got a moment to answer a few of those. But before that, each week here on Travelling Science, we make a donation to a charity of the guest choosing. And this week, Jonathan has chosen to make a donation to Open Door Animal Sanctuary, which provides homeless cats and dogs with a second chance at a great life. So a donation has been made to the Open Door Animal Sanctuary on behalf of Professor Jonathan Lossus. And if you'd like to make a donation to them as well, you certainly can. Or if you'd like to support this show and the charities that we donate to every single week, you can certainly do that too and that would be just incredible either way both those links are in the show notes just down below but for now back to traveling science pigeon shepherd would like to know what's the deal with the cat's whiskers what are they for well the cat's whiskers are remarkably sensitive and so it's a uh, it's 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 a tactile uh, experience they are able to feel the world in great detail with their whiskers. I mean, sort of like the tip of your fingers, but they're even more sensitive than that. In fact, when a cat is uh, catching a prey, when it's right in front of it, it's too close for them to focus their eyes, and it's by touching with the whiskers that they can, fig that they can figure out where exactly it is and, and where to bite it and so on. Uh, so, so that's what whiskers are for. Now, people, of course, know they have these big whiskers on their on their faces, but if you look carefully, there are whiskers elsewhere on their bodies. There are whiskers on their arm, just next to their wrist, and um, 
and in a couple of other places on their forehead. And, and these are used for, 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 for the sense of touch. Wow. Incredible. I didn't know there was whiskers in other parts of the body. Yeah, take a, take a look. Next time you see a cat, you'll see them. Huh. Fantastic. There you go, Pigeon Shepherd. Uh, Apple V has a, a common question that I'm sure many people will be wondering. How do you know if your cat is overweight or just very fluffy? <laughs> well, so... Um, so I'm no veterinarian, of course, but there are there are charts that can tell you for a, you know, what's a, a right weight for a particular breed or a particular type of cat or a, a you know a domestic short hair. More generally, you know, it's kind of like people. You can the, the fluffy hair makes it hard because you can't really see the body outline. But if you feel feel them, you can see if they're really they have a lot of, you know, a big round belly and so on. They might be getting a little chunky. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I feel like that's just, they're just asking for an excuse to keep feeding the cat. But, um, you know, the cat only needs so much food. I, I will say this, just like humans, there is an obesity problem with pet cats. There are a lot of overweight cats. And like humans, it's, it's not good for them. Absolutely. So if you think your cat might be overweight, check the charts. You know, look it up, weigh your cat, and uh, maybe cut back on the, the extra snacks. <laughs> LM is wondering, why do cats prickle on us? Or some people might know this is like, Baking bread or biscuits. Yes, yes. Uh, the technical term is kneading, like you knead dough. Uh, it's also called making biscuits, as you said. And so that is one of the questions I get the most. And uh, first, this is a behavior that kittens do when they're nursing from their mother. And in fact, it's done by all feline kittens or cubs. And they basically rhythmically push with one paw, then the other against the mother's abdomen. The idea is that they are helping stimulate the flow of milk, which, you know, is probably true, but we don't know that for sure. However, as far as we know, the domestic cat is the only species that continues that behavior as adults. And people with cats have probably experienced them, them doing that on your belly, which is both very endearing and yet very annoying because they stick their claws out a little bit too. Or they'll do it on a blanket and they seem to go into a trance. They will do it for sometimes several minutes and finally they will usually curl up and, and go to sleep. It seems to be a sign of contentment and presumably this evolved during domestication as a way of bonding with the people they live with. Absolutely. Uh, it's Dr. Mac was wondering, do you know why cats are fascinated with boxes? Just, just being in a box seems to fascinate them. <laughs> That is a, another great question, and the short, the short story is we don't really know. You know, if you go on the internet and you type that in, there will be people who will give you explanations, which might be plausible. Now, you might think that this is something unique to domestic cats, something that evolved during domestication for some reason. But if you've done a little Googling, you know that seemingly all cat species do this. Google lion box or tiger box or whatever. There, it seems any feline species, you put a box, they're in it. Now, why do they do that? Um, we don't really know, to be honest. One idea is they like the security of it, the, you know, that somehow they feel safer. And you know, one thing to keep in mind in understanding the behavior of a domestic cat is that their ancestor is the African wildcat, which is about the size of a typical house cat. And they live in a place where there are lots of larger predators. And these larger predators will kill uh, wildcats. And so even though wildcats are great predators, they are also prey. And so a lot of what their life is like is being cautious of keeping an eye out. And so that explains some of the behaviors of our domestic cats. But as I told you, tigers and lions do this too. So that can't be the, the whole explanation. Um, honestly, we really don't know. There was one interesting research study where people uh, used tape and just made a square on the floor and the cat would go and stand inside the square. I mean, this is just tape on the floor. We really, you know, fascinating. We really don't know why they do it. This is super interesting. And you can try this at home if you have a cat. Use some colored sticky tape and just make a square shape on the floor, approximately the size of your cat. And there's a good chance that your cat will become fascinated with the square and maybe hang out in the square like it's a VIP lounge at the club. Scientists have theorized, or maybe it was just cat enthusiasts, I'm not sure, but some people think that the box offers protection from danger and a square on the floor offers the possibility of a box, therefore possibility of protection. 
So the idea that the cat might feel safe inside a few pieces of sticky tape. And if you've got a cat, you should definitely try this out. Here's an interesting question from Manzi. She was wondering if it's true that a cat would eat its owner if its owner dropped dead. Is that, is that something that happens? <laughs> uh, no, that, are, that is a great question um, because you do hear about that. And it turns out there is a little bit of information on that. And it turns out that dogs do that much more often than cats. Really? Yes. There are more reports of dogs consuming their owner when they've been left with the the dead body than cats. Uh, Cats don't do it. It does happen sometimes, but it's it's much more common in dogs. Wow. Are you sure you're not just a dog hater that's trying to spread a bad rumor? (laughs) All right. Let me just say one thing about my book. Uh, I spent several years researching the book and it is anyway what i'm trying to say is there are if you don't believe me i put the references in the book at the end notes and um people can go read for themselves these reports there's really some fascinating if gruesome studies there's and here's a sad one there was a guy who who was a cat hoarder he lived with like 10 cats and he committed suicide by taking a huge overdose of sleeping pills and his body wasn't discovered for for many days and the cats were locked in the house with no food so they started eating his body they too died from the drugs in his system oh wow so there are there are stories a number of stories like that about dogs or cats it's really kind of gruesome but um you, you can get the the references to that in my book yes eleanor the scientist was wondering why cats can be so needy one day and then completely independent the next is there any reason why they might have that mood shift <laughs> Well, I've certainly experienced that myself, and um, honestly, I don't know. It turns out that there is a, a a field of cat behavioral scientists. There are essentially cat psychologists that you can consult if you are... That doesn't sound like a particular problem, but you can consult these people. A cat behaviorist or a cat psychologist is somebody who is professionally trained and qualified in the field of animal psychology. And there is actually a show all about this on Netflix called Inside the Mind of a Cat where these experts work to figure out why cats behave the way they do, what cats actually want, and how we can work through issues with our own cats. So if you're curious about cat psychology, definitely watch that show. And if you have a weird little cat, you can get a cat psychologist who might be able to help you out. And these are the questions that they try to figure out. Uh, I would say this field is still in its early days, uh, but people are trying to understand that cats have personalities. One cat is different from another, just like people. And of course, cats have different moods in different days, just like people do. Yeah, everyone has their bad days. Maybe the cat's just not feeling so great. Yeah, true. I've got a question here from Anala, Ashan, and Buddy Cooper. It's a family that I know quite well, and they're concerned about cat allergies. I don't know if you know anything about uh, being allergic to cats, and if that's the case... Is it a good idea to get a cat anyway and push through it? Or maybe is that a defining factor? Well, cat allergies are a surprisingly widespread problem. By some estimates, 15 to 20 percent of the human population are allergic to cats. Uh, Now, for most people, that allergy is relatively uh, minor. It's like you have a cold or, or an allergy to pollen. Uh, uncomfortable, but not life-threatening. But there are some people who routinely go to the emergency room because they have severe reactions. So it can be quite bad. Uh, We know what causes the allergy, and that has to do with a protein that is in the saliva of cats. Interesting. And as cats lick their fur, they get the protein on their fur and their skin. Then it dries and flakes off and and, floats into the air and just becomes some of the stuff in, in the air. People breathe it in, and that causes the allergies. So there's a lot of research on this, and there are a number of things that have been done to make uh, to lessen the problem. Cats vary in how much of this protein they produce, uh, quite substantially. Some produce a lot, some produce a little. So one option is to try to find a cat that doesn't produce very much. There are some breeds of cat, like the Sphinx and the Siberian, that are said to be low allergen cats. Now, it's, it may be the case that some members of that breed are low allergen, but there's a lot of variation. 
Uh, but but that's one option. Is that breed that you mentioned the the furless or hairless cats? Uh, it, it, it's called the hairless cat, the sphinx. Uh, it actually has a very fine layer of, fil- of fur, but it looks hairless. That's the, the sphinx, yes. Also, there are some other things that can be done. A new food has been developed that includes substance, substances that bind to the protein in the cat's body and so prevent it from being in the saliva. And that seems to greatly reduce the amount of protein as well. And so for many people, that might be a solution. Um, there's also uh, two, two other things. One is scient- scientists have found the gene that produces the protein. And so they are now working to do what's called gene therapy. Normally, gene therapy is you fix a broken gene so that you don't have the problem. In this case, they're doing the reverse. They're trying to break the gene that produ- produces the protein. And if they can do that and insert it into a cat, so this would be a, gemeti- a genetically modified organism, which is an issue, uh, they could, in theory, produce a cat that does not produce any of the protein. Now, you might ask, well, is this bad for the cat? Maybe the protein has a purpose. And we don't know, and that's possible. But the fact that cats vary so much in how much protein they produce, some of them producing little of it at all, suggests that it's not that important. I should say these genetically modified cats are not yet available Many people are horrified at the prospect. But on the other hand, for that 15 or 20 percent of the population that has trouble living with cats, maybe it's worth it. Mm. Did you say there was one other option? No, was that all of them? Yes, you you caught me. There is one more option. And that is there is a company that has just announced that they've developed a vaccine that they can uh, use to reduce the amount of protein the cats produce. So it's a vaccine the cat would get. And like the food, it would lower the amount of protein produced. And there were just news articles on this earlier this year. The company says it will be out next year. I'll believe it when I see it. But that that might be coming down the road, too. Wow. So there you go, Anala, Sean, and Buddy. I'm sure they'll be super excited to hear there's four options. You can get, potentially, you could get special food for your cat. You could get a vaccine for your cat. You could get a gene knockout cat or maybe a hairless cat think about it. (laughs) All right. There's actually there's actually one more option. There are vaccines that people can get. Uh, It's for people who are allergic to other things or you can get shots. And there are shots that people can get. I'm told it's kind of a pain. You have to get them every month or so. It's not cheap. But some people will do anything not to give up their cat. And so some people do this. Absolutely. Fantastic. Well, thank you so much for that information. Uh, Shari Ward, might be a dog lover, but she was wondering if cats can love people like dogs do. Absolutely. There's no doubt that there are some cats that are very strongly bonded to the people with whom they live. And uh, there are some breeds of cats that have specifically been bred to be more affectionate. Uh, but just any cat raised well uh, can can bond with this person. Incidentally, I have to, I have, I, I, wait, wait, I, I want to have to point out one thing of that. Um, I've been careful not to use the term owner, because I think anyone who's been with a cat realizes it's unclear who's owning whom. And uh, there's a great expression I love. Dogs have owners, cats have staff. (laughs) Staff. Yeah, that sounds about right. (laughs) Um, Or you can be a, maybe not an owner, but a parent. Does that work? Pet parent? Parent. Some people, some people use parent. Uh, There's lots of different terms. And the last listener question is from Color Climax. And it was asking about something you alluded to earlier, the Toxoplasma gondii. Is this, uh, this is apparently some sort of mind control parasite. Is that, uh, is that a danger to, to humans? All right. This is a fascinating story. It's a little bit uh, long, but uh, there is a parasite called Toxoplasma gondii that can infect many different types of organisms, but it can only reproduce in felines in domestic cats or wild felines. And so if it gets into a domestic cat, it it can then produce millions of eggs, which then get pooped out into the environment. And then if some other animal, like a mouse or a rat or a person or a cow, ingests the egg, that person can get infected. But But it can't breed in any of those organisms. So to anthropomorphize, the goal of one of these parasites is to get back into a cat. 
uh, because that's where it needs to be to reproduce. So there is some research that has discovered that when a mouse or a rat is infected by this parasite, Toxoplasma gondii, the parasite will, will migrate to the brain and it affects the behavior of the rodents. And whereas most rats are uh, quite scared of cats, if they smell cat urine, they turn and move the other direction. Evidence indicates that a infected rodent loses its fear of cats. It may even be attracted to the smell. And when I first heard, and the idea, of course, is they're making the rodents behave in a way that a cat will kill them and eat them. And so it can infect the cat. When I first heard of this research, I didn't really believe it. The story just seemed too good to be true. But it's actually very well documented. And so it, this, it turns out we now know that parasites all, often can alter the behavior of their, of their hosts in ways that are good for the parasite and bad for the host. And this is a clear example of that. Did anybody watch The Last of Us? This is pretty much the same story. A parasitic fungus that takes over humans and turns us into zombies in order to further spread the disease? Turns out this is already being done by cats. Except Toxoplasma gondii doesn't turn us into zombies. Well, at least not yet. All right, put that, put, put that aside for a moment. Uh, a large percentage of the human population is infected with Toxoplasma. In some countries, half of the people or more are infected. Uh, and it varies from country to country for reasons that we don't really understand. But a lot of people are infected. Is it, is it a long-term infection? Oh, yes. Once you have it, you have it. And most people, when they're infected, they will have mild symptoms, cold-like symptoms for a couple of weeks. And then that's it. And for the rest of their lives, it was thought that they didn't affect you. Now, here's the scary part. The parasite gets into your brain. And so it's in your brain, and the idea is that it doesn't have any effect. It's just sitting there because they're not really adapted to us. They're adapted to cats. The one, there are two groups of people who, was, who we've always known this is bad for. One is pregnant women because the parasite, if it infects the embryo, can do very bad things. It can cause birth defects or even death of the embryo. And that's why women are, pregnant women are often told, do not scoop the kitty litter because you, just in case, don't scoop the kitty litter. And that's because of the problem of toxopl toxoplasmosis. The other people are people who, who are immune compromised and they can be badly affected as well. But for most people, it was thought that it, it's not a big deal. Well, in recent years, there's been a whole bunch of studies that suggest that, that the parasite affects people's behaviors in ways similar to the effect on rodents, making people more, uh, more daring, bolder, more curious. Let me give you an example. There was a study that showed that young men who die in motorcycle accidents are more likely to be infected by toxoplasma, most, uh, toxoplasma then are comparable young men who just random from the population. And so that suggested that being infected made you just do stupid, dumb things. And there are lots of studies. You know, each study looks at some other way where people are different and then tries to draw a parallel with what happens to mice. My favorite study is this. Uh, it was a study at the University of Colorado where they asked a whole bunch of undergraduate students to, um, to take a saliva test. You can tell whether someone's infected with toxoplasma just through the saliva. And what they found was that students in the business program were more likely to be infected than students in other programs like math or English or whatever. And within the business program, students in the entrepreneurship track were more likely to be infected than students in other tracks in business. So, I mean, a curious, unexpected finding, and they're, they're arguing, well, maybe people who are, again, bolder or more outgoing or, or whatever, are they're arguing it's the same sort of behavior and analogous to what happens to rodents. Now, I, I don't know that I believe this. It's kind of early days. It's kind of the Wild West of these studies. Uh, but it is interesting to see this association between infection in humans and differences in behavior. And we, we need to figure out what it means. Right. So to answer your question, Color Climax, yes, there is a mind control parasite, but a lot of us are already infected by it. Probably not something we need to be too concerned about. Agreed. Well, fantastic. Thank you so much for answering all those questions. 
Jonathan, your, your information and wisdom on this subject is incredible. Let me just finish. I don't want to take up too much more of your time, but I've just got a quick lightning round, a few quick question answers. Okay, I'm ready. All right, timer starts now. How do you feel about dogs? Yeah, okay. <laughs> do you spend much time watching cat videos online? More than I'd like to admit. <laughs> same. I think that's the same for most people. If, if you could have done something completely different with your life, if you never, never studied science, what do you think you might have done? I might have been a lawyer. Okay, cool. <laughs> what do you love most about cats? Uh, when they're sitting in your lap purring contentedly. <laughs> so good. What do you like least about cats? When they poop outside the litter box. <laughs> so bad. And just to finish off, what is your favorite breed of cat? Well, it's the European Burmese, the ones that my two cats are members of. Ah, that's because you haven't had a rag doll yet. Well, that's what, that's what I, there are lots of fascinating breeds out there. This is true. Absolutely. There we go. Jonathan Lossus, thank you so much for taking the time to come on the show today. I really appreciate you speaking with us and all of your research and your devotion to evolution and ecology and lizards and cats and everything you've done is just incredible. So thank you so much for doing what you're doing and I hope you keep doing it. And just to finish off, I'd just like to ask if you have any final piece of advice or information you'd like to share with the world about cats <laughs> well i i encourage everyone to to live with a cat if they have that opportunity they're wonderful animals there are many cats looking for good homes uh, do so responsibly try not to let them outside if you can get them neutered so that they won't have more cats but uh live a cat full life so there you have it legends that was professor jonathan Lawsus. What an absolute wealth of knowledge when it comes to anything and everything to do with cats. Like if you're allergic to cats, it seems like there are a few options out there and more to come in the near future. Also, who knew that cats were infecting us with mind controlling parasites that just make us slightly more prone to taking risks? I mean, when I was a kid, we had like five cats and I take some pretty stupid risks. So I'm almost certain that I'm infected with toxoplasmosis. And you know what? That's okay. I'll take it. Anyway, just a final reminder that Professor Jonathan Lossus actually wrote the book on cats. It's called The Cat's Meow or The Age of Cats, depending on where you are in the world. And it's a really incredible book with loads of information. And now that you've heard the author speak, when you read the book, hopefully you'll hear Jonathan's voice as if he's reading it to you. And now that we've done an episode about cat science, I think it's only fair to do an episode on dog science too. So I'm on the hunt for a dog expert. And if you know anybody or any other science wizards that you'd like to hear on the Traveling Science Podcast, reach out and let me know because I create this show for you, the listener, and I want to share whatever science you're interested in. So definitely get in touch if you want to hear someone specific. And make sure you subscribe for more Traveling Science every single week and follow Traveling Science on Instagram to see who we're interviewing next and there you can also send in your own listener questions. Finally, if you're more visually oriented, feel free to check out the Traveling Scientist YouTube channel. And if you stick around to the end of the episode, I always leave you with a little secret. And this week's secret is that I recently bought the most expensive pair of jeans I've ever owned. They're like $200. I don't know. Is that ridiculous to pay for a pair of pants or is that like normal nowadays? Well, either way, they fit so damn well and they have a gusset, which I'd never heard of. It's basically an extra piece of material around the crotch area, which gives a little extra space and makes it less likely to get a hole in that area, which is how I've lost every other pair of pants I've ever owned. Anyway, they were super expensive, but they're very comfortable and I pretty much haven't taken them off since I bought them. So I don't regret it. I just call them my fancy pants. Anyway, that's all for today, legends. Thank you so much for listening to Traveling Science and I'll catch you all next Science Sunday. Cheers.